Welcome to Last Week Tonight with Bianca Perez. I am standing in for John Oliver today as he is taking his holiday leave after what some may call the worst year ever, 2016. The year of realizing things, according to Kylie Jenner. But according to me, I want to say the year we forget. So let's get into this. Tonight's main story is about how rape culture affects young Latina women throughout their lives. And just as a trigger warning, I want to disclose that this topic is about, um, does involve the talking about rape and rape culture and about body image issues. So if at any time you need to pause the video or even close away from the window, please do so and take care of yourself. And if my hosting skills aren't up to par, please click away as well. <laughs> uh, go easy on me, it's my first time taking over as host. Uh, so, here we go. As much as identity intersections are beautiful and positive to include in movements, you know, striving for positive change, identity intersections can also lead to further oppression, especially in the context of rape culture. Although all women of color face very, very valid struggles because of rape culture and other oppressive institutions, I will be focusing on Latinas due to my own identity as a Latina and because Latinas are often ignored or lumped together with other women of color when they are being studied, which is rare. <laughs> so... In this case, women of color, Latinas, face many obstacles when it comes to how they are portrayed in the media, how they are perceived by their peers, and how they perceive themselves. So this is a lot to unpack, and hopefully we can get through this in a 15 to 25 segment, if not just volumes and volumes of books. Please read all about this. That'd be great. <laughs> So the media is one of the facets of rape culture that is among the most visual and widespread, which includes in how women's bodies are depicted and, say it with me, objectified. <laughs> Latina women are constantly being objectified, even when they're being portrayed as strong superheroes such as Araña in her titular comic, including in the way that their bodies are drawn and presented, the designs of their costumes, if costumes are included, because some of these costumes are questionable, um, and the situations that they are placed in. So to preface this, in case you're not familiar with the comic Araña, um, she, Araña is a character in the Marvel Universe, the Marvel comic universe, and so she's kind of like the Latina counterpart, not really, kind of Latina spin-off of Spider-Man, you know, the typical uh, young white guy that these comic books pander toward. Please change this, please. Um, and so Araña, she's, you know, she has like that typically depicted, like, you know, Latina body that you are, that you picture from mainstream media, so you know, a uh, narrow waist, fuller hips, ample breasts, lighter skin, and long hair, so this is a very whitewashed, very narrow, and very sexualized portrayal of a 15-year-old teenager, and that's important to remember, a 15-year-old teenager. Um, and so Araña is constantly, constantly being subjected to voyeurism on behalf of, like, her comics creators and who, like, are always allowing readers to, like, really, like, look into very personal situations such as watching her choose, um, her superhero costume, which, you know, should be a moment of empowerment and should be a moment of, like, kick-assery and, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but really, it just invites them into watching her undress and, you know, seeing her in tighter and more revealing costumes for the benefit of these 
largely white, cis, heterosexual male readers who tend to be 18 to 25 years old. So, above Aranya's age range, right? So, this is really problematic because this underage person, his body is being objectified. You know, they, they like, are constantly looking to put her in, like, you know, things that accentuate her curvy yet muscular body. And so this sexualization of her teenage body, teenage body, perpetuates rape culture by inviting the reader to put aside the notion that they should not be engaging in media that objectifies someone who is still a minor, 15 years old. You know, the age of consent in Illinois, at least, is 17 years old. And she's not able to consent due to her age and due to her, you know, having this voyeuristic context, you know, place upon her. And so instead of, you know, engaging with the fact that this is hugely problematic and, you know, maybe turning this around so that this, like, you know, makes the readers think, like, oh, why am I engaging with this media, right? It focuses on her, you know, womanly, and this word is used loosely because, you know, according to the law, she's still a child, very much a child, that she has been given due to her social location as a young Latina. And social location, uh, for those of you who don't know, and that's totally okay, is, you know, how, you know, your your gender, your sexual orientation, your socioeconomic status, you know, your um, ethnicity, maybe, like, whatever race you, um, you know, are categorized into or, you know, categorize yourself into, kind of all come together to, you know, like... To form you, you know, like, where you are located. You know, you are this specific person in this specific place because of who these contexts and identities have made you into. So, this pandering to, <laughs> to get back on track, this pandering to white heterosexual males is <laughs> nothing new. And it's basically what a lot of mainstream media and other, you know, markets pander toward. Um, and this is done because, you know, our society has been structured so that these men have all of the spending capital and all of the social capital, to, let's be real, <laughs> so that their needs and preferences are constantly catered to. Ugh. Can someone say the male gaze? Even if it leads to the... <laughs> exploitation, and harmful stereotypes of marginalized groups. So, you know, it's a pretty icky situation. This video started out funny, and it's kind of ended up being sad. It's kind of like when you, like, you know, <laughs> find a meme, or send a meme that's, like, too true, and, like, you're like, man, I was, this was supposed to be funny, and now... I came here, you know, to have a good time. Now I'm coming out attacked. I, you know, so, but let's move on. Um, another way that, like, Latinas are constantly stereotyped is also in how, like, you know, their emotional kind of range really, you know, is limited to being, you know, naturally sensual and irrational. And so, especially in comparison to men, like, which is, like, in continuing with the example of Araña, um, another main character in the comics is Miguel, who is kind of her mentor and her, like, guidance. And he, like, makes her very dependent on her because he's supposed to be, you know, rational and in control. And, you know, it, it implies that Araña, because she is a woman and because she's a Latina woman, she is unable to, you know, control her emotions and control her superpowers, ultimately. And so, uh, this, you know, this comic is just not a good time. Uh, and so this really does reinforce uh, something called the woman box and the man box, which are kind of visual depictions of how, like, um, 
you know, how, like, let's put, like, you know, characteristics that you stereotypically think a woman should be and what a man should be, you know, like, not even considering, you know, people who follow the title of the giant, uh, the, the binary, who, like, fall, who are, like, gender fluid, you know, who are trans and, like, you know, of other different identities. So this is very, like, heavily, heavily, you know, binary-centered. Um, but anyway, it's kind of, like, pigeonholing, like, characteristics and roles that, like, what women and men are expected to have, you know, in, like, in, you know, day-to-day -day society. So, like, you know, going back to Miguel, he's, like, you know, supposed he's he takes control of all the situations, and he is rational, while women, like Araña, are supposed to be obedient and not in control of their emotions. Um, and this can be, you know, found out about further in, by, in lectures in the CHLH 199B course, uh, CARE, taught by Molly McClay, if you want to know further. Um, and so, like, another example of American media perpetuating these stereotypes is, and this is a really old example, um, is in Desperate Housewives and the character of Gabriela Solis. Um, and who is portrayed by Eva Longoria, a Latina woman, which, sad to say, you don't always see Latina characters being portrayed by Latina women. So you'd think that would be a step toward the right thing, right? But, you know, in, so like, according to Merskin, 2007, you know, Longoria, she is a, you know, she portrays this prominent, oversexed, underdressed, Deci decisive and divisive character who perpetuates the harlot stereotype. Um, and if you don't know what the harlot stereotype, here you go. Um, it's basically depicting Latina woman um, as like naturally promiscuous and you know always happy to expose their bodies uh, and like always being objectified and sexualized and as someone that the white female protagonist should be you know constantly suspicious of you know, you have stealing their men, their white men, so, um, there you go, that's the harlot stereotype in a nutshell, and that stereotype is seen very often whenever, you know, uh, um, Latina women are portrayed in the media because it's just a, a very easy, very, you know, sen like, sensationalized, very, <laughs> you know, just very, like, just very common stereotype to fall into and easy to make movies sell because you know what we're you know what Hollywood's about selling bodies and selling you know identities without even considering how real people <laughs> would you know feel about this and so instead of taking you know this opportunity to create a complex Latina character, who would have thunk, you know, um, who happens to engage in sex often, you know, consensually and enthusiastically. Langoria's character is often othered or made to seem not correct or not um, what someone should be in how she's portrayed um, as exotic, sexual, and available, and as more in touch in her with her body and motivated by physical and sexual pleasure than white women, um, according to Beltran, 2002. Um, so, you know, she is, like, always being held in comparison to white women and always, um, you know, value judgments are always made about Langoria's character and Langoria herself, you know, as a media personality. Um, in comparison to, you know, white Eurocentric standards, which aren't always, in, you know, aren't always, you know, the correct standards to hold someone to, aren't, you know, the healthiest standards to hold someone to, especially if they don't come from that culture. And so, Longoria's lean but curvier body is seen as acceptable in the context of Latina celebrities such as Langoria and Jennifer Lopez because, quote, uh, an ample derriere is coded as an eroticized aspect of Latinaness, so she can be curvy and considered attractive. While this isn't desired, and this is from the Beltran article again, um, while not being desired in mainstream beauty ideals, white mainstream beauty ideals. 
And so, um, stereotypical portrayals of Latinas also um, exist um, in alternative forms of media, such as, we're going to keep mentioning this, Aranya, because, you know, uh, although, are you, you can argue that, you know, Marvel is mainstream because it does, its target audience is, you know, cis heterosexual white males, um, who are probably middle class because they can easily spend this money to, you know, afford these various comic books. Um, we, like, we can see in a lot of media, like, that, you know, phenotypically and culturally whitewashed, um, media representation of Latinas, it, it does cause Latinas to feel, um, dissatisfied with the media due to its focus on very light-skinned, whitewashed, we're gonna keep saying this, whitewashed, say it with me, Latinas, uh, as protagonists in Latinx media and Spanish-speaking programming. So, this, like, because there is such a focus on, like, lighter skin and lighter eyes, there's even a phrase called ojos de color, or eyes of color, when you're referring to blue and green eyes, because there's the idea that brown isn't a color, but brown is very much a color, so we're gonna, I wanna stop that uh, from being used. Ojos de color are every ojos, all ojos. Um, so if dark, Latinas are portrayed in the media, and they very rarely ever are, they are often cast as antagonists or as non-Latinas. Because, you know, you're, if you're phenotypically darker, I guess, I guess you're not Latina. But that's obviously not true because we are a pan-ethnic group. And so... You know, having these whitewash portrayals of Latinas in the media does lead to, you know, Latina women internalizing that, you know, lighter skin and, you know, straight hair and slimmer bodies are what they should be striving for. And so, you know, this really does affect, you know, darker skinned indigenous women, Afro-Latinas, you know, Latinas who are, you know, of mixed race or any sort of combination and so they are deeply affected because like for example um indigenous women um including like indigenous women they are often portrayed as nakas and that means that they're tacky you know that they don't know how to function in the world and that's a stereotype that has been you know it has been perpetuated by um movies that is like um uh, what was her name maria like La India Maria. It's always, you know, they constantly portray her as, you know, someone who's desexualized and who is, you know, um, always clueless and is just always getting into trouble and is making trouble for, like, the white man. And so, you know, seeing these portrayals deeply affects your own image if you're constantly equating, you know, dark skin with, you know, clumsiness, badness, you know, all these negative qualities and you're always seeing, you know, lighter skinned women as the ones who are sought after and the ones who, you know, get the guy at the end and who, um, you know, everything good happens to them at the end and so it, it's, it does really affect Latinas. And so, you know, this like whitewash representation is due to the media institutions and power being overwhelmingly like, so overwhelmingly that I could like, you know, you know, throw a rock and, you know, it's just, there's a white guy there, you know, <laughs> you know, oh, oh, controlled by white men who want to perpetuate white men being in power by portraying these marginalized groups in a negative light. You know, going back to, you know, that woman box that we talked about earlier, whiteness is also an expectation of being a lady, a real lady, not just, you know, so, you know, just, not just a woman, but a lady, you know, it, because, you know, to be refined and to be worthy of, you know, praise is to be white, so, this, so, you know, the white, uh, the woman box really only allows for a cis, white, heterosexual, middle, upper middle class experience due to its very, very restrictive standards. 
And so that's why whenever, you know, feminism is, you know, portrayed in the media, discussed in the media, um, it's white feminism that's portrayed because, you know, white feminism only helps white women and it doesn't attempt to really change the institution. Because university is increasingly becoming more and more common for Latinas to pursue. Yes, great. Um, but this also leads us to have to negotiate, you know, previously uncharted or pre like rarely ever explode, explored territory of participating in hookup culture as a woman of color at a predominantly white institution. So on college campuses, you know, there's that perception of like, you know, if you're going to go out, you're going out to hook up. And this isn't always true for people, but this is the prevailing perception. So we're going to go along with this um, idea for right now. And so, you know, in these, and again, this is a study that's very um, cis, heterosexual, you know, female to male, female and male relationship based uh, interactions is what this study looked at. Um, it, hookup culture is looked at as a, or is, hookup culture is a privilege held by middle class white college students who can experiment with their sexuality without the concern that they, um, that their sexuality will be used to affirm a stereotype, you know, that whites are sexually promiscuous because they don't really get that stereotype about themselves. It's always women of color, it's always Latinas who get that stereotype. And so this it's really easy for white students to be able to participate. Um, and according to Alison Risman, 2014, this is due to the fact that minority students negotiate gendered and ra racialized controlling images of sexuality and may be less likely to hook up as a result. So this could be, you know, Latinas not wanting to play into the harlot archetype that you so often see in movies and TV or um, Latino boys not wanting to, you know, play into that Latin lover stereotype because, you know, you don't want, because Latinx is and other marginalized groups, we often feel like we have to, you know, carry our our group's reputation. And we have to not, you know, act in such a way that brings shame to our group, that, you know, furthers these stereotypes. And so, uh, so we try our hardest to not perpetuate these stereotypes. But these stereotypes still happen because <laughs> white students <laughs> often get their information from mainstream media. So continuing on in the vein of the Allison Risman article, uh, there is the idea that people seek, quote, potential romantic relationships with people that are similar to themselves in terms of race, age, religion, and social class. So, you know, this makes it all the more difficult for people of color to participate in hookup culture should they choose to despite, you know, um, the racial and class divides that were mentioned before. So, you know, this alienation is, like, further compounded by the fact that, you know, these l young Latina women um, may have already begun to at least partially internalize the idea that, you know, white female bodies are, you know, the ideal due to the oversaturation in the media that they, you know, face. And so having this imposed ideal become internalized and perpetuated by, you know, possible romantic and sexual partners can really cause these young women to lose their confidence, their appearance, and in their ability to attract a partner. Uh, many of the Latinx students in the study, which was composed of uh, 87 uh, University of Illinois Chicago students, a university you know so little about, you didn't realize that this isn't University of Chicago at Illinois, this isn't University, this isn't UIC, this is UIC. Um, they were also students who came from lower socioeconomic uh, backgrounds to, who could not afford to live in campus dorm settings that, you know, most of this hookup culture took place in. And, you know, this means that they could literally, literally not buy into hookup culture. And this further alienated them, you know, and separated them from their white middle class peers that could have possibly been, you know, 
partners of theirs um, in this, you know, hookup culture. And so, you know, it, even if, you know, a, a like, student of color is able to, you know, break into this, they risk, you know, being, you know, ignored or worse yet fetishized once they do start trying to participate in hookup culture. And, you know, these problems aren't just a young person's problem as, you know, these young women move past university into adulthood. They still have to contend with, you know, other people constantly scrutinizing their bodies, you know, to see if they do fit the ideal. You know, even if it's, you know, the white thin ideal or if it's the Latina curvy ideal. And so, you know, uh, this leads to this thing that um, Mila Drich in her article calls the paradoxical body image which is has to do with you know Latinas how you know being people of color living in a uh, you know largely white society in the United States you know so as a majority these Latina women like do hold the Latina curvy body as the ideal but individually they tend to see the thin European, you know, Eurocentric ideal as what they should be, what they want to be. And so this, you know, obviously causes you know, cognitive dissonance on behalf of these Latino women because, you know, they are, you know, they are less feeling that they don't fit into either mold. And, you know, this also, this cognitive dissonance also leads to Latinas judging each other because, you know, we are a pan-ethnic group. So, that, so we have various, you know, ethnicities that we could belong to and possibly different values. And so an example in the Rojas 2004 article uh, about um, Spanish-speaking media, uh, a young woman who, you know, engages with this media, watches this media, she was Puerto Rican, she was quoted as saying that Mexican women are always showing everything and that they look like sluts. And so obviously this is a problematic judgment because it's, you know, playing into the idea uh, that, you know, that every culture is perpetuated that, you know, if a woman is dressed a certain way that, you know, she is expected to act in a certain way when it comes to, you know, like her sexuality or, you know, who, who or how many people she engages with. And so it's just the worst. <laughs> and, you know, it, they... These women also worry, in this study, they also worried if, like, white males saw them as nothing more than, um, you know, as, if they saw them nothing more as, you know, villains with, um, exposed breasts, you know, so he, there's, you know, this fear of, like, judgment from the white male gaze as well, and, you know, it, this is constantly perpetuated, as I mentioned before, by, you know, advertisements and television programs that, you know, like commodify, you know, Latina bodies as, you know, a way to produce revenue, you know, you know, or like to sell their product or to sell the, you know, fantasies that they're trying to create. And so, you know, it, it like, it creates, you know, super duper unrealistic expectations of, you know, what Latinas should act like and look like, you know, who they should be with, and it really does kind of poison the lens of how, you know, Latinas see each other. And so to conclude and to really just summarize everything I've said, you know, they're like, Latinas have a bunch of identity intersections that really do kind of affect how they navigate rape culture and other oppressive institutions, you know, not only are they women, but they are Latinas. Latina women, so they belong into these two groups, and if you add in, you know, socioeconomic status, education level, sexual orientation, you know, romantic attraction, sexual attraction, you know, um, gender display, you know, gender expression, it really does compound into, um, having to navigate, you know, rape culture in just, like, such a difficult way, and, you know, obviously no one wants rape culture to exist, but, you know, the, these identities further add into how difficult it is to have to, you know, negotiate with this and have to live with this in your day-to-day -day life. And, um, rape culture really does, you know, force these Latina women to have to look into this, you know, whitewashed stereotype in the media that, you know, kind of forces them to be perceived as, you know, 
sexualized and objectified, you know, bodies, you know, instead of people. And, you know, it really does, you know, perpetuate, you know, their treatment of being seen as lesser, being treated as lesser, and, like, you know, they continue to be marginalized. And so a way, you know, a positive way to change rape culture through the media is to encourage and to financially support Latina, you know, creators in the media because, you know, so that there is a more nuanced depiction of, like, what it means to be a Latina outside of being a body that is being objectified. And that's all we have for our main story tonight. Thank you so much. John will be back in 2017. A year that, well, it can hopefully only be better. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good night.